coming up on Push to Talk. The latest on Borderlands 3 and the surrounding media circus concerning microtransactions. Then, Sonic the Hedgehog movie has the potential to be one of the worst of all time. Are we going to ruin that? And finally, Valve introduces their new VR headset for prosumers, the Index. Uh, Jan gets pretty intrigued by it, and we tease him for it. All this and more on today's show. This is Push to Talk, episode 22, recorded Sunday, May 5th, 2019. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash push to talk and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Then download a title for free and start listening. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Ian, and alongside me, as always, I am joined by Bill and Joe. How are you guys doing this weekend? It's sunny in Canada. It's the start of summer. <laughs> it it is, but we didn't. Did we get a spring? Because I remember last no. week having the heat on, and uh, today I woke up and I was like, "Why is the air conditioning not on?" Like we just kind of skipped that acceptable coolness kind of thing, don't you think? We're very efficient. We just kind of go from one major season into the next major season. Yeah, yeah. Just screw the transition zones completely and just just jump on one from one to the other is terrible because i love spring and fall but they're typically short even on the west coast here like you would think that on the west coast we'd get a bit more of an extended spring which is usually rainy but it's it's um very sunny today and quite warm actually so surprising how about you joe how's your weather today is is uh cloudy and rainy and gross and humid which is the custom in new jersey it's very humid here half the year i think bill can relate right bill humidity is that. Yeah, but we're not really that far away, so that makes sense. I mean, I don't know, um, honestly, like I'm I'm an ignorant Canadian that doesn't look at maps very much, so I don't know how close uh, Joe is to the Great Lakes. But <laughs> huh. um, It took me like 12 hours to drive to Toronto. Yeah, but it would take me like two and a half, so <laughs> yeah, you're, a little, you're, not, you're like 10 hours, 9 hours away. Uh-huh. Okay. But that's still right. not that far. No, in the grand no, scheme. That's not bad. I guess that's our weather and geography update for the week. <laughs> Um, Let's dive right into some top stories, and there's been a lot of them this past week. Bill, why don't you start us off with Borderlands 3? I will, and I would like to uh, handle this in a way where we talk about really happy, cool things, and then we crap all over it. So, That's good. uh, Yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, So... Watching the Borderlands gameplay reveal last week, um, I was just struck by how much I wanted to play it, uh, which is not that common for me, but it instantly, um, and I think you'll agree if you've watched any of it, it's our kind of game. It's a co-op game, so uh, that's immediately, like, there's about three or four games a year that you and myself and the people that we game with that we can play together other than Destiny um, so when we see a game that has a lot of potential and looks like it's really well done and it has a co-op factor, that that usually that usually grabs uh, a hold of our attention. And Borderlands did that for me. The gameplay looked fun, uh, the loot looked fun, the story and voice acting looked good. And and I should also say I've never played a Borderlands game, so this was a very new experience for me, um, getting a, a glimpse at Borderlands. Uh, but man, I was just really looking forward to playing it. Based on that, did you did you watch any of it? Um, I only saw small bits and pieces of it, but I'm in the same boat as you. I've actually never played Borderlands 1 and 2, even though I think I own like 18 different editions of them on Steam. (laughs) Um, I've never never touched it, and then uh, I was tempted when Borderlands 3 was first announced a couple months ago, or um, I was tempted to go back, but honestly, just don't have the time for that. Um, I'm excited about some of these things, because this is the kind of game that we tend to actually put a lot of hours into it, like a co-op PvE-type looter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really our bag. And uh, the only thing that's going to really derail that for us is going to be the release schedule um, and what comes out around it and how much attention myself specifically and you to, uh, you know, an extent as well have to pay attention to that. Um, You know, will we have the time to dedicate to it? I I really hope so. Um, And as much as I'm excited about Borderlands, it took what, maybe half an hour after the presentation and there was a Twitter fight 
between uh, Randy Pitchford and um, Game Informer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, did you catch any of that? The aftermath. The aftermath? Okay. So basically the idea was, um, and I'm going to summarize it pretty basically here, that uh, Randy Pitchford essentially said something to the effect of no microtransactions um, when he was talking about Borderlands 3. And Game Informer found microtransactions. So of course they reported on this as, as they should. And to be honest, I, I think that their article was probably accurate to what he said. But I guess Randy Pitchford's intent was not to say that you couldn't pay for anything in the game, but more so like you can't pay for XP boosts and you can't pay for pay to win, that kind of stuff. Like it's going to be cosmetic items that you buy from the store. It's not going to be hidden in like random loot boxes, you know, like you're not going to spend five bucks and then get a random item kind of thing. Like you just buy what you want directly. I hope I'm right. I believe that's what his intent was. So my take on this is that I believe both of them and agree with both of them. I 100% think that Randy Pitchford either misspoke or was misunderstood. And I 100% agree that Game Informer represented his actual words properly. Um, and it was just a misunderstanding. And I don't know if they've sorted it out between the two of them, but I kind of hope they do because it just was a bit of a rain cloud over an otherwise pretty cool thing for me. I think the the, the biggest thing about it was... I think you're right. I think that what Randy said, he he felt that he was saying something accurate, and when he thought of microtransactions, he thought of them in a certain way and said, "There's none of that." Um, I, I think the most uh, the stuff that was actually the most covered and how I saw it, and I think that's Joe how it ended up on your radar as well, was um, that my first visibility into this was somebody tweeting, "Randy is still tweeting. Stop tweeting, Randy." I was like, what's going on? I think it was more like the actual conversation about it afterwards that blew it all way out of proportion. Definitely. Yeah. Got to keep your mouth shut at a certain point. Yeah. And if you're going to react, you just say, hey, good catch. This is what I really meant, right? Because Game Informer is not out there to crap on something. Um, they have the ability to, like, they can get the page views for reporting something accurately and I'm sure that as every other news site and video games does that's reputable, if there's something clarified, like if a developer comes up to you and says, hey, I read your news story. This is what I meant to say. This is how it actually works. Now that, you know, I have a minute and I'm not on stage with the pressure. This is how it actually works. And this is what I meant to say. They would update it. Then it, that's it. It's over. You know what I mean? I it just made me mishandled a bit by all. There are some outlets that tend to editorialize their headlines a little bit. Um, I think Shack News does a great job of that. Uh, VG247 is probably like the epitome of just like a saucy conversational headline. Um, Game Informer is not like that. They tend to be a little more, I don't know, textbook, I guess. And as a result, this right. is the kind of thing that can happen because there really is no context given in, you know, in that in that H1, you know what I mean? So yeah, uh, this is bound to happen on a site like that, I think. Yeah, you make a good point um, because, I mean, I obviously have a close look at Shaq News headlines and, you know, I mean, people may believe it or not believe it, but there's never a situation where anyone at Shaq News is attempting to mislead. Like, if you say one thing, but we truly believe you misspoke, like, no one is going to try to, like, throw that grenade down, you know. At right. You, you might say, like, uh, Randy Pitchard says no microtransactions, sort of, or, you know, whatever. Yeah, I'm not. I'm yeah, not a writer, no. but you might just like you might incline the reader to like think that it's uh, there's some subtext based on your headline. Yeah, you can be honest and fair um, without you know like it's, you can be objective and honest and fair without uh, starting fights. Sometimes, sometimes the people that are on the other end of it don't care and they're angry. Um, but yeah, it probably could have been handled better at different points and at different levels by everybody by both parties right because pitchford like uh jan said should have clarified and stepped away because there is a war of war <laughs> i'm learning this as i go through my my house purchasing process a war of words <laughs> leads nowhere going back and forth on email going back and forth on twitter in this case no one wins you're not doing anything but making people look petty and m make it seem like you're both bickering so yeah well. i agree um you what about you guys? Any uh, any good news across your desk? Well, I was going to say, um, I actually wanted to find out what you guys think of what makes you most excited about Borderlands 3. And for Joe in particular, who's not going to be playing this on PC, do you, uh, are you into this? Like, Would you play this on an Xbox One? I think so. 
This is one of those uh, in the vein of id. It's id, not ID software, right? I want to get that right. Yes. In the in the ID. in the spirit of id software, I find that Borderlands has that field of view problem for me, where you see too much at once, and then I get nauseous. Life is hard, you know what I mean. So I'm a little scared of Borderlands Three just because of that. If it weren't for that, and I thought it would look like Halo or something, the the conceit of the game, the premise of of a loot shooter, sounds good to me. Um, so much so that I picked up the Handsome Collection or whatever it's called for Xbox for like seven dollars or something last week because mm-hmm. of the trailer for Three. So I'm willing to give it a shot for sure. So I'm I'm curious if there'll be cross platform play, right? There, there's been rumors that it might be cross-platform between Xbox One and PC because that's kind of a uh, that seems to be the easier route to take. Um, right. Anything that involves Sony seems more complicated. Um, but I'm actually kind of excited that if that were to happen, uh, that would actually mean that we could sort of expand our little group of uh, co-op shooter players here. Wow! Bill. Wow! But you guys play with a mouse, right? I'd be I'd be horrible by comparison. Uh, no, no I play with, with a controller, controller. Yeah. 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 and I'm better than Jan is at everything. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um the thing that honestly excites me the most is from this gameplay uh reveal and, and some of the other sites had like three hours or so of actual gameplay just raw gameplay footage so there's lots out there for people that want to watch i kind of i don't know i'm in a situation where i don't want to watch too much of it because i don't want to hype myself up too much and um but i am excited about this idea of the sanctuary three which is like the game's hub and like your home base if you will um and Bill, one of the things that we've harped on Destiny since pretty much the start of it is it looks like in Borderlands 3, you're going to have a personal room, like personal quarters that you can decorate and customize with, you know, little cosmetic things and weapons you've looted and, you know, all basically the kind of stuff that we've talked about. Wouldn't it be cool to have that in Destiny 2 in the tower and I can have like Thorn and the last word on little display racks? I because think they might Lord do that. Lord knows you're not going to use them. Oh. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, attention Bungie, who is not listening, but attention Bungie, <laughs> please do this. I agree. No, that sounds pretty cool, man. Um, I, I, you know, that the first place I ever saw that, I think, was in The Witcher 3, probably in Toussaint. Um, you get uh, the, like, vineyard that you can own um, and decorate and whatnot, and that was really cool. I enjoyed that a lot, and yeah, that's kind of where it came from for me with, uh, with Destiny. You know, I want a place to, I want armor racks, man, and... Borderlands, I don't know if it'll ever be able to replace Destiny, but that sounds like my cup of tea. Yeah, a lot will depend on how Destiny 2 does this fall. Um, Borderlands 3, I think, is scheduled to be out sometime in September. Um, They're going to be days apart then, because yeah. uh, it'll be first Tuesday, I think, in September for Destiny. That's where, what is it, year 3 will begin? Yeah, but I don't think they're actually doing a big, uh, a big hoopla like they did in year 2 and every other year. Yeah, there is no big. Um, and people keep referring back to Taken, the Taken King in, in uh, Destiny One. There's none of that, so it will be an interesting fall for sure. Um, Joe, what was your top story this past week? What do you want to talk about? I wanted to bring up the fact that a eShop title on the Nintendo Switch got taken down for including a code editor. Which violates okay, so uh, Nintendo's... I read uh, this in the show notes. Yeah. My very first question, and you're going to have to explain this to me. Explain Code Editor. Um, well, a- according to the story, there is a Ruby editor, a literal pro- pro- programmatic uh, editor that you can compile and run in the game uh, built into this eShop game called uh, A Dark Room, which many people know as a mobile title. It's a, it's a imageless... Um, uh, adventure game with just text. It's like a black and white experience. Um, so the way it works is that you plug in a USB keyboard into your switch, into your switch dock, hit the tilde key on boot up. And that brings up this Easter egg thing that allows you to type in code again, compile it and run it. Um, and as I understand it, it was fully fed, fully fledged and you could do whatever you want with it. Um, except for, uh, because the engine didn't support it, there was no sort of uh, imagery. It was all, you know, text only. Mm-hmm. So um, this is in violation of the uh, the eShop. Uh, this is in violation of of you know Switch Nintendo Switch uh, software license uh, agreement. So uh, Nintendo 
took it off the shop and the developer, a young man named Amir Rajan, uh, went on Twitter to say, more or less say like, yeah, I was in the wrong. I shouldn't have done that. It's, you know, I, I suppose in the fine print that I can't be doing stuff like that. But uh, the interesting story here is basically that <clears throat> it came about uh, because he went onto Twitter announcing that this Easter egg existed in the first place. So it wow. did get past uh, Nintendo QA or whatever sort of uh, quality control they have in place. It made it to launch, right? And the only reason they found out about it is because he went onto Twitter and started encouraging um, his customers to check this out. So first of all, the, the thing that I think is interesting is that it really is up to human error for... Uh, stuff to make it live onto the eShop for, for, you know, like it's not, it's not as if they're reviewing your code base, right? They probably have an office somewhere with people playing a game and checking it, right? As opposed to yeah, someone... Yeah, I was say, they don't look at source code, right? So apparently it's difficult to track this down. Exactly, exactly. And, and I don't think that that's weird. I mean, it would be, it would be quite an endeavor to like, <laughs> you know, I have a caseworker for the game that I'm making and he keeps checking my source code. Can you imagine that? Yeah, um, that wouldn't be sustainable or efficient in, in any sense. So, I think this is the only way to do it. But with that comes again this human error where they're going to miss stuff like this, and um, it's not beyond the realm of reason that someone could brick their Nintendo Switch, and it would be like a huge, uh, you know, press issue for Nintendo, right? Like here are all these you know bricked switches because of this game that we let slip. Um, that's certainly something that you could picture happening. Remember the. Uh, PSN issue, I think a couple months ago, maybe at the end of 2018, where someone was sending around a a uh, message on PSN, like l- a literal text message on PSN, that if you opened it on your PlayStation, your PlayStation was done, over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so uh, people can do very malicious things with very little, right? And uh, this had the uh, possibility of heading in that direction, but they. They knocked it down. And the second thing about this that I found um, interesting is probably the wrong word, but relatable, I suppose, is that <clears throat> Rajan goes on to say that the days following the takedown and all the backlash he received and all the sort of headache he had to endure because of this, in his words, were, this is, this is, these are the worst days of my life. And I got to thinking about that. And, uh, this is someone who poured his heart and soul right into this game and then he went and effed it up by tweeting some braggy thing about, check out what I baked into my game, right? Like, oh, what a mess, right? This is this guy's job. Mm-hmm. This is his whole career. This is, frankly, his life. And uh, he just created this disaster for himself. So I guess it's sad, interesting. I don't know what the words are, but... Um, it's sad. Um, I It'll be fine. I'm just... I'll, I'll lead with that. Because this is the internet and Twitter and somebody else is going to take a giant virtual dump on something by Tuesday and nobody will remember this except on some, you know, random podcast three years from now, someone will bring it up as an anecdote, but sure. But that's the press yeah. side of it. What about the part where he needs to make money off his thing and he can't get it back whatever I, you know, I mean, there's that side of it too, is what I'm saying. Yeah, but you no, know, he can get a job, and <laughs> yeah, sure. you know what I'm like. I'm, what I'm saying is, this isn't the like. It, it feels like the worst days of his life, and maybe it is right now. But I'm just saying, I don't think that this is like a career-ending thing. Like he's going to go make another game, um, and he was honest about it. It doesn't seem like there was any malicious intent. Like you don't go on Twitter and say, "Hi, screwed Nintendo," because then, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Right, so it was an accident on his part, maybe an oversight. I mean, I don't read the fine print. No, Nobody what, does. You know, you know who should give him a job is Nintendo, because, um, you know, like we talked, the, the testing process is not likely to catch these things, but what's a little bit more concerning from a system architecture point of view is that he was actually able to do that. Um, I, I feel like these kind of devices, you know, that are sort of prone to being bricked, like once it's bricked, it's bricked, and there's not really a lot of workarounds, Um Typically, they're fairly well controlled with what third-party apps can do, right? Like what they can access and 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 how far into the actual system they can get. So, you know, having an editor in there that lets you actually execute code seems like a bit of an oversight on Nintendo's part, too. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. Well, I'm in that, how could you have seen that unless you plug the keyboard in, right? Like like we just discussed, there's no way they're they're not seeing the behind-the-scenes view of this game. They're just seeing the front end. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I th- I don't really know how difficult or easy it would be. I think that we're probably going to see a lot more of this in the future, not just with Nintendo, but with anything. Um, you know, technology is moving so much faster than um, terms of service and law and people can keep up. So you're going to see this is this kind of thing is going to happen a lot. And, you know, it's kind of like unfortunate when it happens to somebody who seems like they had nothing but good intent on Nintendo Switch, but wait until it happens with the bank. Right. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess continuing in the uh, the theme of screw ups this week, um, Sonic <laughs> re- released a trailer much to the uh, chagrin or horror of much of the Internet. Um, Joe, okay. you had some thoughts on, I on that in particular. Yes, and it's not horror, and there's no chagrin, but but much grinning, if, oh, okay. uh, if I can be so poetic. First of all, no, it looks horrible, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I know I'm not alone in saying I'm a lover of horrible, terrible cinema. I think a bad movie, in many cases, is just as entertaining as a good movie. And, honestly, this looks like, this is like a time capsule waiting to happen of this like can you believe 40 years ago when they released sonic the hedgehog 2019 remember that thing i mean just unbelievable that that made it out the door and here we are we're criticized i mean do we really need to criticize the design of sonic can't we just have a bad movie with jim carrey as eggman can i have well, that yeah it feel like with the cast alone this was not really going to be an oscar uh <laughs> worthy movie to begin with but but even if they fix sonic this is going to be a bad movie well, so like there's, there's two issues, right? Is there, there's one thing for it to be like a cheesy movie intentionally, but it seems like uh, they didn't intend for that to no. be perceived like that. And now they're also, they've said that they're going to try and literally fix it, which whatever that means. Whatever that means. But they wouldn't have said that if it was one of those, as you say, intentionally bad movies with, that we see on right. Sci-Fi Channel or whatever. Well, maybe they would have because even if they, you know, were sort of like, even if this was intentional and they thought that, you know, it may not be received well. I don't think they would have anticipated that it would be received this horribly. Like, oh, even man. if they fix this now, that movie is screwed. No one's going to go see it. Ooh, I the disagree. story's over. The story is how bad it was. No one is going to be reporting on how much better it looks like six months from now. Oh, man. See, I have every... Int- I we don't we haven't talked about this i don't like movies maybe we've talked about it. i don't like i don't like going to the movies i don't like watching movies uh i like playing games and that's that's the medium i've chosen for entertainment i'm gonna go see this because this just looks like like a graceful disaster this is in the vein of the room this is uh this is this is a zero out of a hundred right that that now unfortunately they're going to turn into a 30 out of 100 based on these redesigns <laughs> man i i'm disappointed because this this was potentially going to be one of the worst movies of all time and now it just might be a bad movie <laughs> so you're saying they should have just committed yeah fully committed to what it is and they'd probably be remembered for you know like you said that sonic movie with that thing in it oh sure um, sure as opposed to trying to turn it into something better and falling short and it's just going to be the the middling that just no one's going to think about one way or the other <laughs> there's and the a- problem with that is that somewhere there is some dude who is about 63 years old in a suit who knows nothing about Sonic and he wants his effing money back. So they're going to try to fix it. <laughs> Man, I don't know how that trailer goes out the door though. We keep saying this every week. Like, how does it make it to the finish line? Like, we all, if you had any visibility on that trailer before it went live, you're not saying like, damn, that was cool. Damn, that looked really good. <laughs> nope. Like it's not it's not any sort of revelation or you know hot take to say that was that was a bad trailer. It was so bad. Everything about it was bad. And uh, kind of you can relate it to games though, right? I mean, you've seen how many times have you seen studios do the same thing and you're like, "Why? Why would you do that? Why would you release that?" And then it's like, "Well, we needed to get it out before our end of year budgeting, well, you know." And I mean, there's no shortage of bad video game movie adaptations, right? No. No, there's a few of those. No. However, I'm curious, um in the sort of as a contrast to the Detective Pikachu movie coming out later, which seems to be fairly well received as far as what people have seen so far, that maybe that makes it even worse. Well, it's a bad, uh, bad timing, I think, right? Where mm-hmm. it's a, it's probably the one reason that I'm not going to get what I want. It's that they're being directly compared to the other movie of the hour, which is Detective Pikachu, which is another lovable, you know, anthropo, whatever the, I'm stumbling over my words. It's another little cute creature, 
uh, video game movie, right? They can't help but be closely related. And uh, as a result, there's going to be extra scrutiny, and therefore we have to go and fix Sonic's teeth. No, I <laughs> keep it the way it is. I want this in my library. Do you guys remember Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 for Xbox? Remember? No. Do you have any recollection of that release? No. All right. Long story short is that in that game, Sonic the Hedgehog kisses a human woman with his lips, right? You wouldn't otherwise remember Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 for Xbox. That's what I was hoping for here. Something just so like the perfect storm of bad, uh, un- unlike any other franchise seems to be able to do. Sonic has this like unique power to be incredibly bad in the best way. And that's why we have things like Sonic and all the other uh, Sonic related memes. So just don't make it don't make it too much better. That's my only that's what I want to leave you with. Would, wouldn't it be amazing if they have a director's cut of like the original version the original the model fixed version yeah <laughs> and it becomes like that cult classic maybe it gets released as like you know like a limited one that you can only buy at the corner store for some reason like <laughs> oh if only don't get my hopes up <laughs> speaking of new releases and getting your hopes up um you guys are both not terribly into vr are you oh did i, oh, I, I know my... your opinion kind of <laughs> i mentioned my Bill... my borderlands yeah you nausea. mentioned yours you're you're yeah. you're more of a you know want to poop on it and bill's more indifferent (laughs) yeah well no see and for our listeners i should explain that i allow yawn to do all things first so whenever he has a grand idea for technology that's going to cost him money i allow him to do it and see how that plays out and then i will jump into it so when he goes and buys a vr headset and all the fixings i'm like let's let's see See how much use he gets out of this, and how much how much value for the dollar kind of thing. Um, we are in a first very all, expensive friendship. Yes. So I let you dive into VR, and I don't. I think you own. I forget I, exactly. I have an what Oculus Rift. The, okay. Like the and original. It, you don't have a PSVR. Oh, I do. Yeah, I have that too. Okay. Oh. Okay. So I looked at all this, and my thing with VR is very simply that when the headset is is a pair of glasses that you couldn't tell from another pair of glasses. Um, then I'm in, but right now I'm not in and I have no desire to use VR with video games, but I would absolutely love it in some educational application, which I know that they're already doing. There is a wonderful cartoon on Reddit that I should dig up for you that describes you to a T when it comes to this, where it's basically a curmudgeon person saying, oh, I don't want the first generation of VR. I don't want the second generation. I don't want it until it's wireless. I don't want it until I can't feel it on my head. And then by the end of it, it's basically a near-dead person going, man, I wish I had tried VR. Yeah, Um, I'll never hit that last part, though, because I'll just be like, hey, I dodged that bullet and bought a really expensive fishing pole. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, you've got an exit strategy from tech. Yeah, don't you? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's the thing. I don't care. I yeah. like if I, if I miss out on the experience of VR, it's like whatever. I don't care. I bought eighty seven more beers with that. Who cares? So I mean, this all goes back to the fact that Valve announced and and showed details of its new Valve Index VR headset and bundle, which is basically its own foray into hardware. Um, obviously, Valve has with Steam VR supported the. Uh, HTC Vive and Vive Pro, um, as well as Oculus to some degree. But they're now making their own headset. Um, it's coming out, well, pre-orders went out uh, a couple days ago. They were all gone within the first hour or two. So it's going to be shipping like at the end of summer, more or less. Uh, in the U.S. and Europe, no word on Canada yet, so my my bank balance is safe for the moment. Um, but basically, the reason I was excited about it is because it's a, it's, a, it's a higher quality VR headset. So this is not the... Uh, consumer version that sort of everybody wants to, you know, get and that's super convenient. This is the, it's a thousand dollars. You have to be an enthusiast. You need a powerful PC. But if you want the most out of virtual reality, this is the headset that you'll likely go for. Um, Are you going to sell your other VR stuff to get this offset it? Oh yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, um, I'm on a strict one in one out policy as you oh, know right i forgot um, you're one in one out so and the the oculus rift i have is not getting a lot of use um and i'm honestly not sure if i'm going to buy the valve index yet it is very expensive and i would basically need a whole new setup uh i'm a little disappointed that it doesn't have inside out tracking so you still need two sensors at the very least so there's more cables involved and all that kind of stuff but i am excited about its 
higher res screen, faster screen, wider FOV, and just in general, it seems like Valve focused more on comfort. Um, so not just not just physical comfort, even though they've done a bunch of work on that as well. Uh, the built-in earphones, for example, don't actually touch your ears. They just sit like uh, five centimeters or so away from your ear, which actually gives you apparently much better audio quality and directional sound. And you just get a little bit less of that whole sweaty VR head thing. That's definitely an issue, especially in the summertime. Um, but I'm excited. I mean, I, there's some really cool VR games out and coming out. Um, and actually one that I'm excited to try out when it comes out not too far away now is um, No Man's Sky VR, which will be compatible with non-VR version, so we can play this together if I can cool. convince people. Um, and I can be doing my whole VR thing and you can just wander around normally, which so, is exciting. I have a question for you. Yes. I saw some of this uh, announcement and I noticed that Valve said there's, they're making a AAA uh, VR game. Game? And was that announced or not yet? No. No, there hasn't been anything announced. And does that... Um, does that tease or does that information influence your purchasing? Not really, because I would assume that like Valve has actually been really good at keeping its VR content open as opposed to Oculus. Uh, Oculus has some exclusive titles that will only work on the Oculus Rift and its ecosystem, whereas Valve has had, you know, like Steam VR, for example, supports the Oculus Rift headset. So for the most part, any Steam VR game you buy, you can use your Oculus Rift with. Mm-hmm. Okay. But not so much the other way around. There's some workarounds there, but um, it's not it's not really well supported. So I don't think that really makes a difference one way or the other. And in fact, it's almost the opposite because Oculus has a VR game coming out soon that I'm very excited about. I got to play it last year at PAX. It's called Stormland. And it's actually being developed by Oculus Studios. So it's their own exclusive thing. And I wouldn't expect it to work on anything but Oculus. And it's really cool. So that would make any decision a little bit more complicated to be quite honest so your one in one out policy is trickier now it is but i also i mean i really don't have space for two things um the psvr i could justify because it's a whole different thing like it's in a different room it's a different kind of device you know it's it's almost more of a a a party vr thing because you can play games like everybody what's it called keep talking or and nobody explodes Like there's a VR version for that where you're actually diffusing the bomb in virtual reality, which is really cool. So it's a different thing, whereas my PC VR thing is more like a, it's a little more effort, you know, Um, but it's also higher quality. So I don't know, with with a bit of luck, Stormlands will come out before I can get my hands on the Valve Index and I get a chance to play that first and then I can trade it in. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) This is what I'm hoping for. My my fascination with your approach to technology and your current setup is just never ending. I enjoy it thoroughly. So, but are, I know that's off topic, but <laughs> my my current uh, game room, recording studio, whatever this space that I'm in now is not very large, and um, so it doesn't lend itself well to actual 360 degree VR, meaning you know stand up, move around, which you want ideally at least two square meters to do that. Um, or let's say like seven by seven feet or something like that. Right. Um, I don't have that in here. So I've actually been thinking in my head, the guest room, which is just behind me, like, would I be able to get cables that I could just run over there, empty that room out and just make that a VR room? <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's a lot of success there, but that's what's been going on in my head. No more guests. You stress me out, man. It's fun though. Like VR is a pretty cool experience. If you've never done it and you ever get a chance, whether it's at a convention somewhere or even like a demo at like a Best Buy or something like that, definitely try it. It's an experience to be had. You don't stress me out about VR. You stress me out about the idea of running cables outdoors and down halls and into new doors <laughs> and clearing out rooms in order to have space for VR. Like you're talking to the guy who, uh, you know, just to peek behind the curtain for the the, the listeners. Last week, we were talking about new mics, right? And, you know, upgrading audio equipment. And I'm like, oh, that has more cables? No. Mm-hmm. And you're like, yeah. Well, you, you know, be, running you cables should, down the Honestly, uh, the Oculus Quest would be perfect for you. Be- no, no, no. Because it's nope. it's at least it's completely <laughs> wire-free. It doesn't need a PC. It doesn't need anything. It's great. Is it glasses? Yeah, yeah, you got to put it on your head. It's not just like sunglasses I, with VR in it. I'm not sorry. What I okay, then no. Bill, I will no. talk to you. I'll, I will bring VR up again in 40 years. 
Okay. 40. What if Bill was in VR right now? This he whole wouldn't time. know the difference. Exactly. No. And he doesn't realize, he can't see outside of the goggles, but his, the space, the literal on earth space that he's in is just a spaghetti of cables. And he's just none the wiser. <sighs> none the wiser. <laughs> In any case, no. I'm I'm excited. I'm glad Valve is doing that. Um, hopefully, they will come out with a, a really cool VR title, uh, whatever that will be. Um, it would be a kick in the nuts to everybody else if it was like Half-Life 3 in VR only. Wow. It's not going to happen, but I'm just saying. That would be one way to sell VR headsets, Valve, if you're listening. Yeah, right. The only, the last thing I'll say, the only time I was even at 2% out of 100 towards getting VR was when you were cr- climbing around the International Space Station. Oh, yeah. That was it. That was it. That, to me, I was like, okay, that's awesome. That's the kind of thing that, like, that would be cool. Like, actual experiences and seeing mm-hmm. locations that you couldn't see um, or you couldn't visit. That that sort of stuff, that's what would get me into VR. But I'm still at a point where I feel like the technology is going to move fast enough. Maybe not to the glasses point, but it's going to move fast enough over the next couple of years that... Yeah, I don't need to be in on it yet. I can wait a year or two, and it's going to be further along. And you're going to have to buy the same crap I buy in a year or two anyway, so whatever. Probably true. All right. One last story. Um, Epic of Epic Games and the Epic Game Store hmm. has acquired the Rocket League studio, and its name escapes me right now. Psionics. Uh, there you go. So they've purchased them, and they have stated that uh, Rocket League will remain on Steam for the foreseeable future, and... Of course, that has been taken with a lot of uh, skepticism. Has the story uh, changed, though, if I have heard correctly? that To which way? That it will not be supported? Uh, that it'll, the support remains, but the purchasing power will be dying soon. So y- if you it own it... It seem like, you know, obviously I they're not going to cut correct. everybody off, right? But it seems like they've kind of sunset steam yeah, like, yeah. for new stuff. Right, right. Which is huge, because yeah. Rocket League is like continues to be one of the most played games on steam and other platforms too but even the competitive scene uh is is pc based and i imagine many many of those players are on steam so yeah it'll be it'll be a change of pace and it brings up the same thing that we seem to be talking about every week now where epic games does something or says something and people get upset about it in one way or another but you know we've all played rocket league and bill you and i we played it several months ago and we got into it for a few weeks and really enjoyed it but my question to you would be would it have mattered if it was on steam or on something else not today it might have then because i hadn't i hadn't downloaded the uh, epic game store at the time um it would it would really depend i if it was on like for example you player origin or something that i already had then no i wouldn't care but if it required me like i think that when you and i got into rocket league which was like 3 years too late but when we got into it, if it if we had to download a new client for it, I doubt we would have gotten into it because we're just that lazy. We're like, nah, no, we'll just play something else tonight. Um, the reason that we did play it is because it was on Steam and it was, I think, in both of our libraries because everything is. Probably. Um, and we just decided to give it a shot. But yeah, it would have mattered at the time. Um, but I mean, at this point, most people will have the Epic Store, and whether it's yes. because of Fortnite or one of these other new games that's become an exclusive for that store. So it wouldn't matter today if it was on Epic, but, you know, back in the day before I had the Epic Game Store, like, let's say I didn't have the Epic Game Store installed when we started playing, and that's where it was, I probably wouldn't have started playing. There's also a good but, chance that it'll go free-to-play. Um, just that's, you know, that's what Epic's doing with Fortnite. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what Cyanox always should have done with Rocket League. As there is a pretty robust, uh, you know, cosmetic infrastructure there, um, which I'm certain they make a killing on. Um, so that twenty dollar barrier to entry seems a little silly, but um, you know, I don't know much about the econo- the economics of the game, so I'm I'm sort of guessing. But I, you could definitely see Epic taking that taking that pathway, and if they do, um, you know that's obviously going to bring in tons and tons and tons of new people and which would make uh the the store that it's available on even more moot of a point yeah personally i i don't i don't quite understand the outrage about having to launch it from a different thing like i understand that having multiple launchers is a bit of a pain in the ass but it's it's just it's another app it's another software app that you launch and then you know we've got 
five or six major ones already. One more. If you, if you really enjoy Rocket League, it's not a big deal. And yeah, you're right. It, it going free to play certainly seems like a possibility. Um, right. And I mean, the game has been out for for years now, so it's it's time. You know, like it's a very popular game, but it's time for it to sort of move on to its last um, stage, which typically seems to be free to play for very popular games, especially ones that have a good cosmetic and microtransaction system built in. Oh yeah, and they they definitely do, man. Yeah, I've spent money on there. But I will counter the whole what's one more piece of software. I think that no, nah, no. Um I hate that. And I I've gone on about that with you just in Discord as early as yesterday. Um where I'm so tired of everybody asking me to sign up for one more thing or download one more thing or subscribe to one more thing or click one more thing like um I, I'm very I remember much over that. the fight that it was to go from TeamSpeak to Discord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. F this, we're not doing this. And now I'm like, oh, I don't even have TeamSpeak installed. Um but the thing is is that the difference is is that 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 adhered to tie this up very nicely with your one in one out. I got rid of Discord or sorry, with TeamSpeak. Yeah. So something left. In this case, nothing gets to leave. I just have to add more crap. Fair enough. Um so and I already have the Epic Store, so it's kind of a moot point. But the point is, the next thing where someone comes along and says, well, now I have a launcher. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm probably not going to keep signing up for new streaming services. I'm probably not going to keep installing new launchers. Like, at some point, as a consumer, I have to just say, if nobody buys your stupid crap, then you'll stop creating your stupid crap. So, even though I'm only one man, I'm going to lead that charge. And I love Rocket League. Same. There you so go. I'll play it on Epic Games. Super same. I actually think the Epic Game Store is really good, which I can give it a pass. So everything I just said was BS. <laughs> it's it's not bad. And it was certainly, you know, if the game does go free to play, it will certainly bring people over there if they haven't used it yet. The the whole thing is like, okay, I will install this because it's free is is very compelling for a lot of people. Especially when it's just the conversation, the pedigree that it has. Sorry. Oh, no. The conversation that we need to have again and still and more and probably not enough time today to do it. But man, like, is there weekly meetings at Steam where people are just freaking the hell out. Like, this is about the third time Epic has just upside the head with a baseball bat Steam. Yeah, I don't mind this one as much because, I mean, they did just purchase the studio. That's what companies do, right? And I think at this point, it, it's not like they've offered Psyonics money to switch and abandon Steam. Like, they just outright bought them up. And now it's theirs, and Epic can do what they please so I have less of an issue with that. But you're probably right. I mean, there's got to be people at Steam. There's probably like a an, an Epic Games task force over at Valve that just tries to figure out what the hell to do next. Um, I think there's a scarier conversation in that Epic Games is becoming the Google of gaming or the Apple or, you know what I mean, like, or the Facebook. Like, they're, they're entering into a very dangerous territory where they have a lot of power, a lot of resources, and they are going to continue to assume control of more and more and more things and how comfortable are we with that i i and have no numbers to back this up but i do feel like some of that is overblown because if it wasn't for fortnite this wouldn't even be a thing like steam i think is still such a powerhouse compared to even the epic game store that we need to look those numbers up at some point and talk about i'm sure that somebody because... has probably written a really good article on that but you know, I, I don't I don't think that there's any like existential risk to Steam, if you will. Yeah. Oh, I think I it's not it's not to Steam. I think they'll do fine. I think it's to us. That's the risk. It's to us. It's to gamers. Because Epic, like, there has been a mass exodus of games going exclusively with Epic and now they're buying studios. This is a little studio. Wait until they buy a big studio and then five and then 10. Like, Mike, wasn't it? Was it Microsoft that just started buying studios last year? Yep. Yeah. I think Epic, I mean, that's also a concern. It doesn't matter who does it. It just, it worries me. Like, I don't want all of my entertainment potential tied up in one massive powerhouse company. Even if there's other powerful companies, I don't want one of them to be like the one in control that calls the shots. And it feels like Epic is inching that way. You could say that Valve had been that way, though, all these years. They didn't piss me off, though. <laughs> That's yeah. true. We, we'll revisit this in six months and see um, see how things have changed, if they have changed. Um, in the meantime, I want to mention my recommendation for this week's Audible book. If you haven't checked out audibletrial.com slash push to talk, you should do that. 
uh, you'll get a 30-day free trial. And my recommendation for a book this week, of course, relates to some of what we talked about. And it is The History of the Future. And it is written by Blake J. Harris. It is a book based on the founding of Oculus and basically how the, the rift came to be and how virtual reality became to be uh, an actual product. Um, he spent uh, a long time actually behind the scenes at Oculus, and it's a, it's a fascinating kind of story. So if you want to look that up, uh, if you go to audibletrial.com slash push to talk, and then look for the fu- the history of the future Oculus Facebook and the rep- revolution that swept virtual reality. It is highly recommended, and we'll have a link in our show notes as well. Now, this past week, even though the weather has been nice, we've been playing some games. Um, I know, t- in typical fashion, Bill and I have been playing some of the same things, but maybe uh, you said last episode, Bill, that you couldn't talk about Days Gone yet at that time, but you finished your review for Shack News now. Um, I did. So what were your thoughts? Uh, I liked it. I didn't love it, but I liked it. Um, I liked it from a gameplay perspective more than I liked it from a narrative perspective. Um, I thought that it lacked some of the polish that I've come to um, accustomed to with uh, PS4 exclusives. Like when you look at things like the Uncharted franchise and um, I'm drawing a huge blank or God of War, for example, last year. I know Spider-Man as well. Like those seem to be very... um, highly polished experiences and i thought this kind of fell short of that a little bit it just seemed a little bit more clunky in its execution that being said i still think it's a great game and if it wasn't if it wasn't um held up to the standard of a bunch of other ps4 titles which is inevitable i think that it would have been just fine on its own like it's you know uh above average good game but it's not it's not fantastic um i think it had one of the best uses of zombie hordes that I've ever seen, if not have ever seen. Um, it was very cool, very eerie. Um, they did a very good job of tying the motorcycle to Deacon in a way that made it sort of like his lifeline and introducing like a fuel mechanic that uh, kind of allowed the bike to be more than just like this thoughtless thing that you ride around on. Like you had to like plan your trips and know where you're going and how much fuel it was going to take and could you get back and, you know, where was a safe area to go. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it doesn't seem like yeah. you want to run out of fuel on your bike in a zombie-infested landscape. No, probably not in any circumstances, but especially, uh, you know, days gone, they they punish you for that pretty pretty severely. It didn't really seem to be that much of a problem. It was something that you had to keep in mind, though. Um, but in a nutshell, the gameplay, I thought, was pretty good, um, above average, and I enjoyed it. Um, the story, it there was a definite... Uh, lull in the middle where I uh, was like pretty bored with things and it didn't really seem to be moving very quickly. Um, and then it picked up at the end. So it kind of turned things back around and, and, and tied off someone's loose ends as it should. Um, but yeah, it, it maybe came off a little bit longer than it needed to be in my opinion. Hmm. That's a bit of a bummer because I think I'm still at the uh, the early stages where things are still progressing nicely. So hearing that there will be a lull in my near future is not terribly exciting. It's not your near future. It's a long game. <laughs> like, or it just it, either it's a long game or it feels like a long game. And and long games are fine. I thought Uncharted Four was about three or four missions too long. Ooh. I thought that you you don't agree. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah, there was a couple probably at the 75% mark where they just became more sneaking through fields. Um, and I kind of thought the same thing with Days Gone. Like, I don't like I don't like adding hours to the gameplay unless they need to be there. And I felt like Days Gone suffered from that. Like, somebody in a boardroom might have said, like, this isn't long enough. You know, more walking around and more zombies. Um, also feels like a pretty small map as well. It's not It's not small, but it it's uh it definitely doesn't have that vast that vastness feeling that you would get from some other open world titles i think maybe that's just because you're moving so quickly on a bike though did you find the story compelling throughout i wanted to know what happened but i wasn't i wasn't drawn into like i have to start up the next mission right now because i need to see what happens it was more like probably at i guess close to the halfway point it turned into more of a i have to play the next mission so I can hopefully get to something that has a payoff. Mm-hmm. So 
it's also very difficult in that game to tell what is an essential story and what isn't because a lot of things are labeled main missions and I guess they you know if the developer says they are they are but they didn't really attach themselves too directly to the actual like main narrative that you were after well I mean like I said I've only played it for a little bit and um, so far so good I do feel a little bit like it's not quite as compelling as some of the other Sony PlayStation exclusives. Um, but in recent years, those are pretty, pretty high uh, levels to to sort of reach up to. Um, you know, the last few Sony exclusives have really kind of hit it out of the park. I haven't actually played Spider-Man yet, but from what I understand, that was also excellent. So it, it, it's it's tough. Um, I, I do enjoy the character, at least in the beginning, Deacon. Deacon St. John, is it? Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, I like part of it. I still wish that some of these games were had a, a co-op mode. I don't know why, but I find myself feeling a little lonely when the world is, you know, like not very welcoming. So yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. And there was actually an opportunity for that in this game. I think that probably wouldn't have taken a terrible amount to sort of pull off. Um, I say that it would have taken a lot, but just in the grand scheme of it, it probably wouldn't have taken as much as adding it from scratch, but a co-op mode would have been great. I also think that if this game had just released, like let's say for whatever reason, this was a PC exclusive that was not tied to Sony in any way, people would just be saying it's a good game. Yeah. Right now, but it has to stack up to like Spider-Man, God of War and, you know, Horizon Zero Dawn and Uncharted and The Last of Us and all this all-star lineup. Particularly because it's a little bit related with zombies and sort of the whole undead disease thing, bad stuff has happened, you know? It does have that. It's basically, it's got some of The Last of Us in there. It's got, it actually has some Uncharted in there. Um, And it definitely, it's basically like playing through Sons of Anarchy. Um, After kind of like crapping on the story a little bit there, I will say that anyone who's watched Sons of Anarchy, I don't think that we're going to get into a debate about how compelling that was. Like it wasn't the best writing. It wasn't the best narrative. It wasn't the best acting, but it was fun. And if you like Sons of Anarchy and you like The Last of Us and you like Uncharted, you're probably going to like Days Gone. Yep, that's what you told me when I started it. So and um, so far, so good. I guess I just wish I had more of a motorcycle gang than just the one dude whose arm must be falling off any day now. But that's not a spoiler, is it? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, want to answer because I would be first, yeah. like 15 minutes. Anyways, moving on from that. Um, Joe, what have you been up to in playing? What I haven't said every single week is that I play Rocket League all the time for the past two years. And uh, so I feel like just based on our chat today, I should maybe uh, focus on that. Um, I'll mention that I completed that Box Boy game that I was talking about last week, which I thought was really good. Uh, Ten bucks, and it's just like puzzle galore, short and sweet, um, and super bite size. So I, I definitely recommend it if you're on the nintendo switch box boy plus box girl i believe is the is the name um but yeah rocket league is is pretty much like a mainstay for me um in in the not professional sense i've become very good at it and uh i haven't really dove into a game in this manner since tony hawk 3 (laughs) um which i was like all about like the leaderboards and all that at the time and, oh, it is uh, fun to be getting better at Rocket League, isn't it? Like when we started, we were obviously terrible at it. But then when you start to learn a couple of skills a- and you can see your skill improve, it's very exciting, I think. It definitely has this, um, it has it has a element, the gameplay has this element that is so rare to the, to the extent that I would have trouble like naming another game that does this, um, certainly does this as well, in that there's a move set. There's a number of buttons on the controller that do a thing. And there's just this almost infinite amount of depth tied to those different mechanics, right? Because the game is basically just a sandbox, a physics sandbox. And because of that, it it literally becomes about you reading the ball heading toward you and trying to get it at the perfect angle. Like there is so little of that in video games that that I I think that's why I've I've stuck around with Rocket League because you can I'm at 900 hours or something and wow. and I'm still like missing shots that are my fault because there's just so much there to get better at right it's mm-hmm. like if you picked up basketball for the first time you know like 900 hours later you'd you'd be starting to make some shots right 
So uh, uh, go go Raptors, Kawhi tonight, man. Congratulations, Bill. By the way, I meant to tell you that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, big fan of Rocket League, and uh, yeah, I thought I'd mention that it's a big time sink for me. I like that you play and beat so many games that you can just leave one out, and it doesn't even affect how many games you play and beat. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like. In order for Jan and I to sound interesting, we got to be like, well, we, we played our destiny. Uh, you know, we, we dipped into the division, you know, all the same things we always play. But, oh, boy, I returned to Hitman that I've already played a whole bunch of. And you're just like, oh, yeah, but yeah, no, I have those, too. I play Rocket League for 900 hours, but I don't need to mention it because I play 800 other games a week. It's <laughs> I, just... I don't know if I'm, like, super proud of all these stats, though, to be <laughs> honest with you. Man, I got to go for a be. jog or something. But um, yeah, we all do. Yeah, we all do. I assume. I mean, I don't know. I don't know who I've, ne- I've never met either of you. <laughs> I, it wouldn't matter. I mean, you could uh, you could show me a hundred and sixty pound, five foot nine man that uh, says I don't jog, and I'd be like, you should go for a jog. <laughs> Seems like a thing that everybody should do. Fair enough. Yes, and I should. Uh, but yeah, so um, I, I do manage, to, as you say, to to find time for the. For the one and dones and the mainstays, and uh, I don't know if my life will accommodate that for the rest of my life, but right now I do have that good fortune, I suppose. Well, I uh, I received the, your copy of uh, Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild that you sent to me. Thank yes. you very much. And I'm I, it, it dawned on me that it will be possible for me to play this on the Switch in handheld mode as well, and actually go outside and combine. Not not during a jog, but a outside hammock game session mm-hmm. is in my near future. So I'm excited about that. Um, that sounds great. And in the meantime, I've been playing some Anno 1800, which is it has become my Sunday morning coffee relaxing game until everything goes up in flames. But for the most part, I find it a really chill, beautiful game that's just really enjoyable if you want to, like some low stress gaming. Is it a 4X game? What kind of game is that? No, it's like a city builder-ish in a way. Um, it, you know, it's it's like a, a city management type of simulation. It's all about the industry. You got to supply your citizens with, you know, beer and canned food. And, you know, to do all that, you have to build the requisite, you know, farms and processing plants and, and all that kind of jazz and manage a little bit of money. But I found that on... Um, at the very basic, easy setting of the game, it's quite forgiving um, in the sense that nothing really seems to be too complicated. Um, it all makes sense, and it's just it's just really enjoyable at this point. Um, I had a big beer festival that took off in my city earlier. I have no idea what caused it, but everybody was happy and drunk for the most part, which was <laughs> brilliant because apparently people spend a lot more money, and my finances went through the roof during that time. So That's um, cool. It's also really beautiful. Like I, I like the art style. It's you know obviously eighteen hundred, so it's um, old world, new world. You take your ships on expeditions to the new world to discover new lands and and populate those islands. And it's just it's really pretty. And it's a real nice change of pace from like the Destiny two stuff or the Division two. Um, and in some strange way, it's related to Sea of Thieves, which Bill, you and I got into as well this past week with varying degrees of success. I want to say. Yes. Do you mean between the two of us or just in general, like uh, as we moved along the experience together? Uh, as we moved through the game, like I think we had lots of fun trying out fishing for the first time and doing some of the tall tales, at least the first one until we ran up against Captain Briggsy, who's a real, you know, unpleasant character to deal with. Yeah, that was that was a poorly designed section of that. Um, it just doesn't fit with the game. Uh, so for context, like, you know, we went on one mission and solved puzzles and, you know, floated around and got chased by Megalodon and went fishing and cooked. And, um, I think, you know, we probably had our ship sunk once and then we went to the second mission and did a bunch of the same stuff. And near the end of the second mission, it's like, Hey, go kill this person. And we went to do that and we quit what 20 minutes in, uh, at least, I mean, I didn't keep track of it. It felt like 30 minutes. So let's say we hit this enemy with 40 cannonballs probably 100 rounds of sniper ammo uh maybe 50 to 100 swipes with a sword and we were like this is bugged let's quit yeah we quit because we thought it was broken it's not broken they gave her more health than the dreadnought in destiny 2 um 
And yeah, I think it is. I don't know how that got past a human being that played it and out the door. Yeah, it's too bad because for the most part, um, those those quests, I really enjoy them. Um, for those that aren't familiar with them, it's basically, there's no map with things highlighted and circled for you. Like you pick up a, a map or a quest log book of some sort and you read the descriptions and you try to figure out where you need to go based on that. Like it's true treasure map, so, uh, you know, hunting. Like there's no shortcuts unless you go online yeah. and Google it, but it, nothing tells you where to go. Like you got to look at it and, and take the clues and figure it out yourself, which is a lot of fun. It makes you feel like an actual pirate hunting for treasure. Um, and then that fight just seemed so out of sync with everything else. It, it, it just didn't seem to fit in, which is... Well, it, go ahead. And a couple things. It's I, I still think the game, like, even though it's... I'm not, like, 100% engaged in Sea of Thieves, um, but I can objectively say, like, if I had to review it, it would probably still be a 9. Even with, you know, Briggsy, and even with the fact that it's just probably not going to be the game that I return to, like, Joe's Rocket League. Um it's still probably a 9 out of 10 game. Uh, that being said, that fight, yeah. Um, sea of Thieves isn't really built to have bullet sponges. Because you don't really have the means to do so much damage that you can take on a bullet sponge. So, that yeah. just, it kind of... I know you want to try it again, but I'm at the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to wait till Rare almost inevitably patches that. Well, the frustrating thing is that it's it, this was basically at the end of a two-hour journey. And um, all that resets when we gave up, right? So yeah, we, we have, have to, to redo the, the two hours prior to that Oh man, um, to do it again, which is a bit of a bummer when you've got, you know, somewhat limited time or you've got conflicting priorities, you've got a lot of other stuff to do. Um, that sucks. It's not great. Yeah, and it's tougher for me because even though, like, the, the reason that I will play it going forward is because you want to play it. Because as for myself... Um, I, I was already going, why am I doing this? And now it's like, well, not only why am I doing it, now I have to do it again and I don't know why I'm doing it? That's that's a that's a tough sell. Yep. And with that, speaking of tough sell, I think that makes for a good ending to this week's episode. I do want to know from listeners, and I will post this at the Push to Talk Twitter account, which is at Push to Talk FM. Talked about Sonic earlier and Detective Pikachu. I want to know from people what their favorite movie adaptations of video games are just out of curiosity so we'll put that up on twitter you can follow us twitter.com slash push to talk fm and you can find our podcast and website at push to talk dot fm as well uh any closing thoughts from anybody joe bill uh check out rocket league it's a good game i yep i have to agree if you have never tried it you really should i have no i have thought all my thoughts You've thought all your thoughts that's good. We will come up with new thoughts for the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. Mm -hmm.